Hi, my name is uh, Jason Fernandez. I am um, a past student of this course, took it to believe in 2016. Big fan of the concept of Lab and P590. And uh, today I'm here to talk about, well, I essentially represent my original presentation from the course, minus the CRISPR stuff. But uh, I'm here to talk about oncolytic virology. It's uh, the idea of using viruses to treat cancer. Uh, it's something I'm really passionate about and I love talking about. So. Uh, also, I'd like to thank all you guys uh, for coming, giving me the time to present, and uh, thank you in advance for all the weird and random analogies I'm about to give. So, uh, actually, let's start off with an analogy. Uh, if you possessed uh, technology that you perceived to be more advanced than, uh, than your enemies, and let's say that technology was about to be lost in enemy hands, then you would think it's in your best interest to, uh, to destroy that technology before the enemy can reverse engineer it, engineer it and perhaps use it against you, right? And this has been the case in many wars in World War II. Uh, battleships are often scuttled or purposely sunk so as to avoid enemy getting their hands on uh, the secret information or secret technology. And more recently in the raid, in the, I believe in 2011, in the raid on Osama bin Laden, one of the Black Hawk helicopters that was involved in the raid was damaged and wasn't able to leave. So the Navy SEALs opted to destroy the helicopter instead of letting it get into enemy hands. Now the point I'm trying to make isn't that you should destroy technology before it gets in enemy hands. But the point I'm trying to make is that if you uh, if you can obtain if you find a way to, of obtaining enemy technology, you can uh, reverse engineer it. You can use it against you. Uh, you can use it against your enemies. You can use it to fight your battles for you. Now, how does this apply to on-click virology? Great question. Um, when you think of a virus, what do you think of? You think of HIV, influenza, SARS, smallpox, perhaps things that make you sick, right? and things that we'd perceive as an enemy of mankind, an invisible enemy of that. But what if you could uh, take a virus, understand how it works, reverse engineer it, so as to say, and uh, find a way to use it for you, find a way to f use viruses to fight your battles, the battle of disease, and in this case, in the case of oncology virology, using viruses to fight a battle against cancer. Now, uh, uh, in order to understand oncolytic virology, I'd like to give a bit of a primer on cancer, uh, biology of cancer, and also viral life cycles. So, uh, a bit of background here. So, as you're all probably aware, cancer is a global cause of death, or a leading cause of death globally. There's enormous cost uh, associated with cancer in terms of its research and treatment. Uh, for example, the National Cancer Institute over the last decade has had a budget, of, annual budget of around $5 billion. I'd also like to briefly uh, talk about and denounce some asinine conspiracy theories that exist around cancer research. I've grown to despise certain social media platforms such as Facebook because uh, it only serves to make me a more cynical person when I see things like people ranting about how uh, there's already a cure for cancer and the government or the Illuminati or the New World Order is preventing its release for an equal number of asinine reasons. Uh, it's just ridiculous. Cancer is an uh, incomprehensibly complex disease. There's just so many factors at play here. And part of the reason for that is that there's so many different kinds of cancers there's, that affects many different kinds of tissues. So ideally, if there was a cure for cancer, it would be kind of a, a shotgun cure-all approach where one treatment or an adaptive treatment could be adapted to treat many different kinds of cancer. But that sort of approach still eludes us. But with the oncolytic virology, while it's speculative, I think in the future it very well could be a potential shotgun cure-all approach, but it remains to be seen. So as I mentioned, cancer is incredibly complex. There's uh, many, many different pathways of bio uh, biochemical pathways development, as you can see here. And uh, yeah, there's just part of the thing that makes cancer hard, difficult to treat is that there's so many different types of cancers and each one requires a specialized treatment regimen for that given tissue. So what is cancer and how does it form? So in order to get, understand cancer, cancer, one must first understand the central dogma of biology, that is the notion that uh, DNA gets transcribed into RNA, which gets translated into functional protein. So think of it this way. So imagine you wanted to download a program off the internet. You go to the website, you download the program. It's probably going to come to you as a zip file. You need to unzip the file, and then you're left with an executable file. You run that. That instructs your computer how to install the program, and boom, you have a functional program. It's kind of the same thing with the central dog my biology. In this analogy, DNA is the zip file, RNA is executable, and uh, the protein is a functional program. Uh, DNA needs to be unzipped or transcribed to RNA, and RNA needs to be translated to, it needs to translate its instructions to ribosomes to make functional protein. And so your body is made up of trillions of cells, uh, which make up the different tissues of your body. And 
your every pretty much every cell has the entire copy of your your whole genetic code, all your DNA, your entire genome. And the information in DNA uh, is encoded within varying sequences of four chemical bases: adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, or ACT and G. And varying sections of sequences are what make up genes, and a gene will encode a specific protein, or in some cases, multiple proteins. But what is protein? Protein is absolutely essential to life at the molecular level. It has so many different roles. Just a few examples are it's, uh, the drug receptors uh, that dr or whatever drugs you're taking uh, is made of protein. The antibodies your immune system creates to fight infections is made of protein. Uh, even the hair in your head is made of protein. It's just very, very important. But what is it physically? Uh, well, what protein is, is just strings or building uh, of, of these compounds called amino acids. And uh, in mammalian biology, there's 22 different amino acids that are assembled onto a growing chain of amino acids, like beads on a string. And the message encoded in RNA or the instructions in RNA dictates the order of these beads or order of the amino acids, which overall dictates the st structure of the protein in, in three dimensions, which uh, dictates the function of the protein. And, uh, and RNA essentially gets read by these molecular machines called ribosomes, which are in, in the cell that does the actual translation of the RNA into functional protein. So as I mentioned, you have uh, th trillions of cells in your body that make up the varying tissues, but these cells age and uh, need to be replaced, or they might die and need to be replaced. So your cells constantly divide to facilitate that. Uh, in order to do that, they also need to replicate their DNA and move through the cell cycle, as you see here. Uh, but in order to get past different parts of the cell cycle, there's these checkpoints that block it at certain stuff and make sure everything's okay. You can think of it as like a military checkpoint. Uh, say you roll up on a military checkpoint and, I don't know, uh, the guards see you doing something they perceive as dangerous, they don't like, they're probably going to shoot you or arrest you, and you're not going to get past the checkpoint. And it's, it's the same sort of thing inside the cell. If the, DNA, if the cell senses something is wrong, so perhaps there's DNA damage or hypoxic damage, then the cell cycle will be arrested, the cell won't be allowed to divide anymore. Um, so here's kind of where cancer comes in. So there's these things called proto-oncogenes. These are what encode, uh, typically encode things called growth factors, which are proteins that allow the cell to proliferate and promote proliferation, rather. Uh, they're aptly named because proto means pre, onco is cancer, and gene is gene. So uh, as you can imagine, proto-oncogenes, or these, like the growth factors in code, could potentially lead to cancer. and if untouched. So, but, so, but these proteins and, and the genes are highly regulated and the protein themselves have regulatory domains that prevent them from being activated unless the correct signal is sent. Um, so, uh, but the issue is, again, these proto-oncogenes can be mutated. So let's say that mutation occurs in a gene, in, a, in an area of a gene that encodes a regulatory domain of the protein. Then you're going to, the, the the protein is not going, is going to lose its regulatory ability and next thing you know it's going to be always on, constitutively active and uh, that, as you can imagine, is probably going to lead to cancer because the cells going to be able to proliferate untouched or uh, freely. But what about the checkpoint proteins? You'd think that the checkpoint proteins would prevent that, right? And, and indeed they do. There's this other set of genes uh, called tumor suppressor genes or tumor suppressor proteins. One example of uh, these genes, this protein is something called P53. This is a protein that's absolutely essential pr to prevent cancer, and what they do is they can, P53 can actually sense DNA damage, and when it does, it, uh, it signals to the to cell to stop the cell cycle and to stop cell division, so it, it can completely uh, shut down division, and therefore, if there's a mutated protocol oncogene, it can stop the, the, the expression of the gene and uh, that gene spreading to its daughter cell if it, was, if it were to divide. But P53 is, is a protein, therefore it has genetic origin. And uh, because of that, that P53 gene can also be mutated. If that were to happen then, and say if the mutation was such that it uh, inactivated the protein or the fu functional protein was no longer working properly, then you're gonna have, uh, the, if there's a mutated proto-oncogene, you're gonna have uh, untouched uh, proliferative growth leading to a mass of cells, also known as a tumor, and that's how essentially how cancer forms, and basically, uh, in around half of all tumor samples uh, found, there's 
it, it's found that a mutated copy of 53 or of p53 is found in, in all of these samples, or half of these samples rather. And so it just goes to show how important p53 is to preventing cancer. And you know, it's interesting. Do you know that elephants almost never ever get cancer? It's rarely ever seen them. And uh, but can you guess how many copies of p53 elephants have per cell? 20 copies, while well, we only have one copy per cell. So it goes to show just how important it is to pre preventing cancer. So now that the background stuff's out of the way, I can talk about something that I'm very interested in uh, and I find extremely fascinating. That is the innate ability of viruses to kill cancer cells, aka oncolytic virology. So first I'm gonna talk a little bit about the conventional cancer treatments. And so things like chemotherapy, radiation therapy, uh, while they are effective for the most part, they tend to be rather harmful and have a multitude of side effects. The reason for this is that they tend not to be very selective. They tend to kill both healthy cells and cancer cells. And as you can imagine, that's a bit of an issue. There's work, made to be, there's work being done to make it more selective, but uh, newer age cancer treatments like oncolytic virology and uh, cancer immunotherapy seek to uh, make it highly selective. So, uh, Oncolytic virology first kind of started in the early 19th century when uh, this is when viruses are first, roughly first discovered. And uh, in that time, uh, physicians noted that cancer patients would go into spontaneous remission following uh, infection with a viral disease or hepatitis or whatever it is. And it wasn't until recently until researchers realized that uh, it's actually uh, uh, viruses have an innate ability to target cancer. So, and again, this stems back to uh, my idea that we're kind of turning our former enemies again, uh, for us to fight our battles and we're exploiting viruses to kill cancer cells. As I mentioned, it's very potent therapy uh, with little to toxicity for the most part. And what's important is that because uh, with the rise of some genetic engineering tools like CRISPR and other things, uh, these viruses can be optimized to make it more suitable for uh, a given cancer. And uh, also important is that it can be combined with stuff like chemo to uh, make both treatments more efficient. But what are viruses? As I mentioned, you typically think of viruses as things that make you sick, right? And uh, while that's true for the most part, uh, there are some rather benign viruses that don't necessarily uh, cause disease or cause any symptoms. And there's also less benign viruses that can be attenuated to make them less dangerous. But what, what is a virus? So all of viruses is essentially uh, little bits of, of a nucleic acid, so DNA or RNA, that's encased and protected by a protein shell called a capsid. Uh, viruses, the end goal of a virus is to replicate itself, make many copies of itself and produce viral progeny. So they do this by initially invading the target cell uh, and hijacking the, machine, the molecular machinery such that it turns the whole cell into a, a virus factory. Now I think molecular biology is just absolutely beautiful, but for me viruses are the epitome of this natural beauty. They're just absolutely brilliant and as far as I'm concerned they're the perfect organism, if you can call them that. But so this is just like a general scheme of how uh, of a viral life cycle. It's, just keep in mind that different viruses have different strategies for how to accomplish the end goal of making viral progeny. But initially the, the virus will attach to its host cell via protein-protein interactions uh, based on a uh, protein-based uh, cell attachment receptor on the virus uh, capsid that matches specifically to another protein present on the host cell. So note that that means that uh, the virus is selected for cells that express the correct receptor. And then the virus finds a way of getting inside the cell uh, or injecting its, R its nucleic acid into the cell. For the purpose of simplicity, let's just assume this is an RNA virus. So the virus attaches the cell, gets inside the cell, unloads its RNA inside the cell, and this is, again, just amazing. So, uh, you know, I said the cell has an innate ability to replicate its own DNA. Now, the virus hijacks similar machinery of the cell to replicate its own RNA. So now you have many copies of viral RNA inside the cell, and you're shutting down host replication of its DNA. Then some of those RNA copies, viral RNA copies, go on to the ribosomes. Those are the guys that translate host protein. So now the virus is hijacking host protein translation to translate its own RNA into more viral proteins, such as the capsid proteins that make up the shell that protect the nucleic acid. So when uh, the proteins, the viral proteins build up and eventually the, they get together and form the viral structure of capsids and RNA, uh, well, some extra copies of RNAs inserted into the capsid and boom, you have a brand new copy of the virus, a replicate copy of the virus 
And uh, as, this, as these viral progeny build up, eventually they'll leave the cell. Sometimes they just diffuse out. But in many cases, they, they grow in such large numbers that they actually burst through the cell, killing the cell. And what's important is that every one of those uh, virions that are released, or the individual viral particles that are released, has, in theory, has the ability to, to infect another cell and start the process all over again. So can you see how this could be useful for uh, cancer therapy? So now you might be asking, uh, why would you treat a disease like cancer by causing another disease? And that, that's a good question. But the idea is that uh, oncolytic uh, viruses are highly selective and tend to preferentially kill cancer cells while leaving your healthy cells untouched. And the reason for that is your healthy cells possess, possess these uh, intrinsic antiviral immune uh, biochemical pathways that are separate from the rest of the immune system. So basically what the cell does when a cell senses a virus is present, it, uh, it rings the alarm bells, it causes the virus, uh, it, it shuts down the very machinery that the virus uses to replicate itself. And in some cases the cell might decide to commit suicide through apoptosis to uh, protect its friends. But in cancer cells, these pathways are often disrupted. Therefore, the virus can, for the most part, can freely propagate within the cancer cell. And so that means, well, in, in, in theory, the virus can invade both healthy cells and cancer cells. It'll tend to only kill the cancer cells. And uh, also, I'd like to talk about the immune system, because the immune system goes hand in hand with cancer. Um, in theory, cancer happens fairly regularly. There are cells that could pass, the, uh, there are mutated cells that could pass the checkpoint blockade and will, if left untouched, will go, will pro proliferate freely. So the immune system has been conditioned to survey for cancer and it will go around surveying for cancer, but it needs a bit of a boost. So think about it like this way. You're waking up on one of these cold Edmonton winters, nice cozy bed, and obviously your alarm gets you out, but you don't want to get out of bed. But what does get you out of bed is a nice smell of coffee brewing in your kitchen. And that's enough to entice you to get out of bed, but at the end of the day, you're still half asleep driving to the bus station. The only thing that actually gets you going is the caffeine and the coffee. It's kind of the same thing with this, guys. And uh, the immune system needs a bit of a push, and a bit of a flag or a flare to find the, the site of the tumor. So, uh, and that's exactly what the virus does. When the virus kills the cancer cells, it releases uh, what's known as tumor or uh, specific tumor markers, known as tumor antigen, and the immune system loves it. It gulls it up and it mobilizes its troops and sends a directed anti-tumor, specific anti-tumor response to the site of the tumor. And additionally, the, the virus itself is going to induce an immune response against the virus. So it acts as a, another flag to the site of the, the tumor. And uh, in general, when the for future cancer therapies, I think the, the tr trend seems to be is uh, eliciting a strong immune system response. And part of the reason for that is that, uh, and why it seems to work much better, is that you know how when you're fighting an infection, say your immune system encounters a brand new pathogen it's never seen before, it'll struggle to fight an infection initially, but it might eventually kill it off. And what's important to that is that it's going to develop a memory against that pathog uh, pathogen. So the next time you encounter the pathogen, uh, the immune system's going to know how to fight it. It has it's retained that memory, and it's going to clear the infection much easier and quicker than before. And the same sort of thing goes with anti-tumor memory. If it does, if it is induced, which isn't always the case, but that's the goal. If anti-tumor memory is induced, then uh, in theory, it should prevent relapse of the cancer in the future. And so, as I mentioned, uh, there's been a number of uh, clinical, or there's been a, a bunch of research into oncolytic viruses over the last few decades. And uh, a bunch of them have gone through clinical trials, and there's even a few on the market at the moment. Uh, for example, an oncolytic virus based off the herpes simplex virus, that's the same one that causes STDs, cold sores, and all that nasty stuff. It's attenuated though. But anyways, uh, oncolytic virus based off herpes simplex, called TVEC, uh, past phase three clinical trials in 2013, and two years later, the FDA approved it for use against melanoma or skin cancer. Another virus, vaccinia virus, that's the uh, same thing that's used to vaccinate against smallpox. A uh, variant of it called JX594 is in trials to treat uh, liver cancer. And there's also many other viruses being investigated, such as adenovirus, which is one of the common, one of the causes of the common cold, polio, and even measles. So again, this is this idea of using our enemies against us or a forest, rather. 
I don't get into too much data here, but uh, I just pulled these figures from two separate studies. The one on the right here. Basically, they grafted tumors onto mice and uh, either treated the mice with uh, the oncolytic virus, which is the vaccinia variant, or they left it uh, treated with PBS as a control with no virus present. So on the y-axis here, you see tumor volume, and on the x, you see days post-treatment, or time post-treatment in days. And uh, this big black line here that seems to uh, go up, uh, that's your control with just PBS. So as you can see, as uh, time goes on, the tumor volume increases until eventually they had to euthanize the mice. And then all these other lines here are treatments with different levels of the oncolytic virus. And as you can see here, uh, day 14, the, you could, there's a marked de decrease in the size of tumor volume following treatment with the virus. So it shows you how well the virus is working. And what's, what's also interesting is it did some fluorescent imaging here. So the virus is engineered to express a green fluorescent protein. So basically, wherever there's actively replicating virus, uh, it causes a cell to fluoresce green under a fluorescent microscope. So uh, this is the control here. There's a bit of background fluorescence, but as you can see, not very much virus at the side of the tumor. And here in day 14, in, with the virus treatment, you see a big bloom of green that shows you just tons of actively replicating virus in a large portion of the tumor. Then, and, day, and the, the, these pictures correspond to the graph here. So at day 28, when the tumor shrinks a bit, you see a, a, a big decrease in the amount of virus present and that's actively replicating, indicating that the virus is, for the most part, is restricted to the tumor. And at day 56, when the tumor is pretty much gone, you see almost no actively replicating virus and the green you see is comparable to the background fluorescence. Uh, another study published in Nature in 2011, uh, they took uh, 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 cancer tissue f uh, from the colon, endometrial lining, and rectal cells of uh, mice uh, and matched it to healthy tissue that surrounded the cancerous tissue and treated that with either PBS as a control or the vaccine variant oncolytic virus. Uh, as you can see here, uh, initially in the control sample, uh, N stands for normal tissue, C is cancerous tissue. Uh, here you can see background levels of fluorescence, so as you can imagine, it's not too much, there's not going to be any virus in control. And even in the virally treated sample, you see no virus present, uh, indicating that the virus doesn't do well in healthy cells and doesn't kill healthy cells. Then in the cancerous uh, uh, tissue, you see no virus in the PBS sample, which makes sense. But then when you, in the virally treated sample, you see a big bloom of green, you see a big bloom of actively replicating virus, indicating that a virus is doing really well inside the tumor. Uh, or inside a cancer tissue. And the fact that it's not in the non cancer tissue indicates that, again, the, the oncolytic virus is highly selective for the cancer environment. So, uh, this is a bit of a shameless plug, uh, as uh, I, again, I'm, I find the oncolytic virus extremely fascinating. So, for the last two years, I've been working in a virology lab over in the MMI department, sixth floor HMRC, under the guidance of Dr. Myers from Levitz. We study rheovirus in the context of its oncolytic nature. And uh, so what makes rheovirus a uh, prime candidate as an uh, oncolytic is that it's very, very benign. For the most part, it doesn't cause any symptoms. Everyone's had it before, I guarantee you. And in adults, no symptoms. Maybe minor flu-like symptoms in children at the most. It's displayed a very high selectivity for cancer cells with low toxicity to your healthy cells. And Oncolytics Biotech, oh, this is my boss, by the way, Dr. Shmulovitz. But anyways, Oncolytics Biotech is a company out of Calgary that's uh, running clinical trials for this virus. And it's in a number of phase two, three clinical trials in, uh, for use against a number of different cancers. And just last year, the FDA gave it fast track designation for treatment of metastatic breast cancer. So some very promising stuff. So uh, in the future, uh, again, I'm biased here, but I think oncolytic virus is just amazing. Uh, one of the reasons why I am so excited about its potential is that with the rise of genetic engineering technologies and our rise in understanding of cancer and virology, it makes sense that, the vi that each virus can be genetically optimized and engineered to uh, adapt to specific cancers and be used against spe uh, specific cancers. And what's more interesting is that, and this is a bit uh, speculative, but it has been done before, uh, oncolytic viruses in theory can be, mod can be engineered to, uh, to uh, contain accessory genes. So these are genes that encode proteins that aren't necessarily important to viral function or replication, but are genes that can be included in the oncolytic virus to target other aspects of cancers, such as metastasis or tumor growth 
or angiogenesis. Uh, and, and again, uh, oncolytic viruses can be combined with stuff like chemotherapy or, or in newer age therapies like immunotherapy. And this will potentiate oncolytic activity with both these treatments. And the thing is like with stuff like chemo, you can't really dose escalate if for very aggressive cancers. You can, but it's up to a certain point where the, the, benef the harms caused by the dose escalation is worse than the benefits from the chemo. But with oncolytic viruses, you start off as a small dose and it kind of dose escalates automatically if the virus self-replicates. And you combine that with something like chemo, you reduce the need for dose escalation of the chemo because both potentially, it, they potentiate each other's oncolytic activity. So uh, in summary, again, I think oncolytic viruses just have remarkable potential for the future of cancer therapy. And uh, instead of killing two birds at one stone, it kills four birds at one stone. And uh, because it kills cancer cells directly, and uh, these oncolytic viruses can be fitted with accessory genes that target other aspects of cancer, such as metastasis and uh, angiogenesis. And most importantly is that the oncolytic virus elicits a specific anti-tumor response uh, by the immune system. And this is really important going forward in, in the future cancer therapies in general, not just oncolytic viruses. But most importantly is that this immune response seems to persist in, in uh, immune system's memory. So it reduces the, the possibility of cancer relapse. And again, this is very speculative, but I, I believe that in, in the future, decades from now maybe, that with the rise of this technology and other associated genetic engineering technologies, it very well could be a real shock in approach to curing cancer. Maybe one wi virus won't specifically cure all cancer, but it, it, it can be, a, it's easily adaptable enough that it can be used in many different cancers. And uh, yeah, uh, are there any questions? So any questions? But what are the barriers to having this much more widely used? Why isn't there more of this uh, approach at present in 2018? Like, uh, why, why there aren't too many oncolytic viruses on the market? Yeah. Uh, part of the reason is that uh, it seems, at, at the moment, like, for example, for real virus, it seems to be working much better in mice. Like, it works amazing in mice, but doesn't always translate over to uh, to, to humans as well. And in other cases, uh, some oncolytic viruses tend to be kind, have a similar side effects as chemo or they have similar, similar danger profile as chemo. But uh, um, yeah, the, the, the one of the main reasons though is there's so many, like in humans there's so many other factors that at play here. Like uh, as I mentioned, the immune system can really help uh, uh, destroy the tumor at, by using the virus as a flag. But the immune system attacks the virus before it can get to the tumor, or before it can, the virus can do much damage to the tumor, then it kind of ablates the, uh, the oncolytic virology there. Um. So are, have there been serious side effects in some of the existing clinical trials where the I wouldn't this was wild and patients sicker than they were before? I wouldn't, not that I'm aware of. I don't think there's any serious side effects like that. But like you do see common symptoms associated with viruses like cancer uh, or like uh, fever and stuff like that. But uh, and the idea is, and again, it's a fairly new technology, a fairly new ther uh, therapy. So you want to make sure all the kinks are worked out before we really start using this in humans. Right. So this is the second time you presented on, on this topic. How, how is this presentation different from the first? Or what have you learned in the last year? Uh, I've uh, I said, uh, not much is different than the actual presentation itself, but my belief in oncolytic viruses has grown tremendously by attending a few seminars on, on it. I'm like, I went to a seminar last year uh, uh, about a guy from, I think, University of Ottawa, who it's one of the big names in oncolytic virology. And he was saying just how, how remarkable it is, he's a doctor, and just how people are, have no other options left, and they try this oncolytic virus, and next thing you know, the cancer is gone. They're right back at work a few weeks later. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, not much has changed in the pres actual presentation, but I, I still firmly believe in the power of oncolytic virology. And uh, mm -hmm. thank you, Adam. Um, what about like, ch like, children that have cancer? that don't have immune systems as strong, or just people who are immunosuppressed because of maybe HIV or something? Is uh, that is a great question. This still a good option for them? 
Yeah, yes and no. In theory, because okay, okay, if you're immunosuppressed as a result of, say, HIV or whatever, that attacks your adaptive immune system, so the, the cellular part of your immune system. But your cells still are going to possess those intrinsic antiviral immune pathways. So the virus is, in theory, like real virus, it doesn't do well in healthy cells at all, but it kills cancer cells really well. So in theory, I suppose, if you're to treat an immunosuppressed patient with the oncolytic virus, the virus should, in theory, propagate freely within the cancer cells, and, but still not do so well in healthy cells. But the issue is that one of the most powerful parts of oncolytic virology treatments is that it elicits an immune response. And if you're immune suppressed, that can't really happen. So in theory, it could help. I think if you combine it with stuff like chemotherapy, then yes, potentially it could be very useful in, that, in those kinds of situations. But I, I haven't really looked into literature into that, so take it with a grain of salt, but that's my opinion. Also, like, um, is the prognosis better depending on, like, can you start the treatment, like, at any stage, or is it... Um, I'm not entirely sure about that, to be honest. Uh, but uh, f I would assume that it, it, it can be started fairly late, because uh, it just got... Uh, approved uh, last year, real virus, for example, just got approved for treating advanced metastatic breast cancer. So the, the idea is that this cancer is already at the point where it's spread throughout the body and, and it seems to be very promising in that. So whether you need to start it earlier or not, I'm not sure. But I guess in theory, if you, I don't know, were to like shoot up some real virus uh, before you have cancer or something like that, I guess it could be prophylactic. You never know. But uh, I'm not entirely sure about that. And also, don't shoot up viruses. <laughs> so, what is it about like the healthy cell that makes the virus not want to? So, uh, so you know how I said viruses, uh, when they replicate inside any cell, they hijack the cell's uh, transcriptional or replicational and translational machinery. So, they hijack the cell's ability to replicate its DNA and hijack the bills or RNA and hijacks the cell's ability to translate protein, or translate RNA into protein, right? So the cell senses that a virus is present using different proteins present in the cell. And when that happens, it sends off a bunch of alert bells, a bunch of alert signals to other proteins in the cell that shut down the same structures that a virus will use to uh, replicate itself uh, until, and typically when that happens, it also re releases a substance called interferon into the blood, which uh, attracts an antiviral immune response, if that makes sense. So basically, the idea is that uh, the virus can sense, or the healthy cells can sense that virus is, is present and will shut down the, the stuff that the virus uses to replicate. But in cancer cells, those very same pathways are disrupted, and even though the virus or the cell may be able to sense the virus is present, it can't exactly, it can't efficiently knock down those. Uh, machines that the virus uses to replicate. Yeah. Um, can you use oncology um, to reverse physical damage? For example, uh, you know how you have uh, HIV and how you have reverse transcriptase, right? Could you be able to perhaps create your own code, put it into the HIV, and use that same idea to perhaps rejuvenate cells, for example, destroy the liver, or drinking or something like that. Could you use that same idea, or would you recommend a different type of treatment? Um, in theory, I guess so. But like, it, it wouldn't necessarily be HIV. Like, there's uh, HIV belongs to a family of viruses called retroviruses, which have uh, first transcriptase and have the, have the ability to insert its own genes inside the host cell's DNA, uh, such that every host cell will have that the viral DNA f uh, every time it replicates, and. Uh, are you familiar with CRISPR? So the, uh, CRISPR is like this fairly new genetic engineering method that uses a retrovirus called lentivirus to deliver uh, proteins that essentially do the same function. They insert your gene of interest into the target cell. So while it's hard to say whether it could ever be an effective treatment or an effective way of like rejuvenating cells, but I, I guess it's possible, but I, I, it's very speculative, it's hard to say. So um, with viruses like herpes simplex, you see um, latency after initial infection, um, and it reoccurs when the body is weak or certain triggers. Yeah. Um, with viruses used for 
oncology, do you see that latency where the virus will reoccur? Um, see, that's actually a good question because the fact that HSV is used to treat melanoma, I just like most viruses don't have that latent capability of hiding out in your neurons or what have you and coming back when uh, when time is right. Uh, some viruses do, like HSV, HIV, for another one. But uh, I'd assume that the herpes simplex that's used to treat melanoma has been attenuated to, uh, to knock out those genes that are associated with latency. So I don't think that'd be, that's too much of a worry. But or would the latency not be ideal, um, like in the case oh, of reoccurring cases? Oh, oh, you mean so you could come back out? Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose, but I think the idea is that it's safer to induce memory via the immune system and to prevent relapse rather than just have a virus that'll come out. Because latency, uh, latent viruses tend to only come out when uh, the time is right when a virus can exploit the host. So for example, HSV, like from like the STD HSV, will uh, come out of latency when, typically when the immune system's stressed. So if you have some other infection or perhaps if you're in immune suppressors or something like that, but yeah. Is there ever going to be an oncolytic virus that can target multiple types of cancer? Because a lot of a lot of the examples are uh, For specific a specific cancer. virus that targets one specific cancer, like a melanoma or a hepatocellular carcinoma. Is there? Uh, uh, see, do you see yeah. there ever being one that targets multiple ones? I could, uh, yeah, I could definitely see that uh, targeting multiple cancers. Uh, and maybe not the same virus, but I could see like genetic variants of the same type of virus. For example, genetic variants of vaccinia virus GX594 could be used to treat multiple different cancers. And, uh, and what I found in my, in my research at least is that, or at least what our lab has found is that uh, Rio virus doesn't do so well in lung cancer, but does really well in breast cancer. But it doesn't mean that it can't be adapted to be used for lung cancer. So uh, it's possible in the future, but again, it's hard to speculate. But with, again, the rise of genetic and genetic technologies and just how good we're getting at it now, I think, or humanity's getting at it, I think uh, oncolytic virology could be very adaptable to suit a given cancer. Um, I guess a follow-up question then. Uh, since there's so much that you have to adapt for a virus to target a certain cancer, right now in the new future, is it a cost-effective strategy? Or is there heavy cost involved in actually giving it to patients? Not necessarily. Well, I'm, to be honest, I'm not sure how the actual cost of treatments, uh, but I imagine it's cheaper, or at least when technology becomes pretty prevalent, I would imagine it'd be cheaper than something like chemo. Because uh, like you have to think about a lot of these new age drug treatments. Well, in theory, they're not. They don't cost a lot to make. Uh, part of the cost that pharmaceutical companies charge is to recoup the costs of research and development, and uh, so f in theory for any cancer treatment, uh, as time goes on and, and it, it becomes more prevalent, you'd expect a decrease in price. But, but I'd, I'd imagine for now, uh, unless you're on a clinical trial, it'd be fairly expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you get a sense in your lab of what, uh, how your work compares to the general fight against cancer? So, do you guys have relationships with other labs that are using these types of viruses to fight cancer? And then do you have a sense of relationship with people who are taking a totally different approach? Um, with our lab specifically, we have uh, joint lab meetings in the fall and, and the winter uh, with other groups in the MI department that study on clinical viruses, like Dr. David Evans actually studies uh, vaccinia virus, uh, the one I talked about. And we also have a joint meeting with Dr. Mary Hitt in the oncology department. She's, uh, she helps run our, our mouse experiments and, and is a great source of help. So in that regard, yeah, there is a bit of uh, communication. But in terms of labs outside that, uh, maybe at conferences you meet people you know in the field. But, uh, but I think moving forward, that would be a great area to expand into. Yeah. I mean, what I'm wondering about is whether there's a sense of cooperation that we're all in this together, or is there a sense of competition? You know, it's either you or I'm sure it's a bit of both, depending on the lab, depending on the supervisor. Like my 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 Shmulev, she's fantastic. She's always open to cooperation, but uh, there are other people in the field, not necessarily on like virology, but other people that start that study real virus that might not be as cooperative. And and again, like this kind of the nature of 
scientific research is always publish or perish. So, yeah, yeah. yeah which is unfortunate. But well, it's one of the ongoing questions: Do you get more out of competitive environment, or do you get yeah. farther if uh, if you cooperate? Talk to each other? Yeah. yeah. So do you think, like, let's say in the future, it's not possible for a single retro virus? Uh, to be used as a shotgun for all cancers, but what if, if you use like multiple retroviruses that cancer different specific cancers? If you use multiple retroviruses, you inject it into a host with multiple types of cancers, would that work? So you mean like if, say, if a cancer metastasizes to different parts of the body, so you have like brain or like lung cancer and I don't know, throat cancer or something like that, if you use multiple viruses against it? Uh, in theory, that should work, yeah. But uh, uh, you again it's very speculative uh, you'd have to depends on a virus depends on other factors like your immune response depends on the drugs you're on but yeah that that's true you can definitely combine therapies in theory yeah. so you talked about how these target uh, the viruses target specifically cancer cells so whenever you're injecting something into a body or like a, a patient you have to be careful that it doesn't interact with anything that you don't want it to interact with that's what we discussed with nanoscience and uh, nanofunctional materials and all that stuff. So, and then you mentioned that your healthy cells have the ability to fight off these viruses. Mm -hmm. But do you think in patients that have, like you said, they have processes and they have immune response, but do you still think that there'd be cause for concern on whether or not the patient would be, you know, healthy enough to undergo this treatment? Or like react negatively to the virus, or like in, in a very dangerous way? Yeah, that's, that's that's a good question, and it it, it also dep it, I think it really depends on a per patient basis. It, uh, but if the virus is in theory safe enough that it, it doesn't elicit a very strong immune response against the virus itself, then in theory it shouldn't hurt the patient too much. Because, like for example, say like uh, whenever you're sick with an infection, for the most part, it's your immune system's response that actually makes you feel terrible. Like for when you have the flu, uh, your immune system res uh, responds by pumping up the cytokine called tumor necrosis factor, or TNF-alpha, and that's what causes muscle aches. Uh, so if, if, you're, if your oncolytic virus doesn't elicit a strong immune response or something that's dangerous necessarily or something that hurts the patient, then yeah, you, uh, the chance of interaction or the chance of a bad uh, reaction is kind of markedly reduced. But again, it depends on a per patient basis. Yeah. Um, is there a risk for, so oncolytic viruses target cancer cells and the, some of the features that are in cancer cells appear in like dysplasia or hyperplasia <laughs> and, and some of the cases in there might not end up being cancer? So like a, a, a hyperplastic population of cells might not turn into a cancerous tumor. Is there any risks involved with an oncolytic virus targeting that group of cells? I know that some of the drug therapies that they use for cancer, there's worry that, um, well, in terms of testing and in, um, treating, that um, you could potentially diagnose a hyperplastic population That's as cancer. a tumor and give it treatment. And so is there anything going on with that in terms of oncolytic viruses? Uh, I'll be completely honest. I'm not too knowledgeable about that area, but hyperplastic cells and that sort of thing. But in theory, if you were to knock out those hyperplastic cells, W uh, would it be a bad thing? Um, like, I, again, I, I don't really know. I no, I don't, I don't know either. Oh, okay. I think, based, well, based on, based on the little I've learned about hyperplasia, it's kind of like, uh, it serves as a big issue for false positives. Oh, okay. And you don't want to treat the patient overall. Well, in, in that regard, then, the reason why you don't want to treat false positives is that there's so many negative side effects associated with radiotherapy or chemotherapy or, or conventional therapies that uh, why, put them, why put the patient through that stress if it's unnecessary. But uh, with oncolytic viruses, for the most part, are, especially if it's a benign virus, you're not gonna have too many symptoms. So I, I guess it wouldn't really be too harmful. But again, I, I'm not knowledgeable of that area, so take that with a grain of salt. And uh, also for what you're saying uh, about the, uh, a, injecting a virus causing interactions, I believe for a large part of the clinical trials, the virus is injected directly into the tumor. So it, that also gives it a better chance to replicate within the tumor before the immune system gets to it and before the immune system can cause a huge response against the virus. Because, uh, yeah, I guess I can, especially for your 
bad viruses like I don't know, Ebola or something, viremia or viruses in the blood is not something that's ideal and would cause a bit of a systemic issue. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? All right, well, thank you, Jason. Thank you.